Do I hesitate to preach this passage, really? I'm diffident about it. I'm not confident because I realize that I'm preaching on the job description of elders and pastors everywhere. The God-given job description, or one of them in the New Testament, which tells us from God what we are to be. But I understand that Peter's included this in his letter that's meant for all Christians to read, not just for elders. He didn't write a separate letter to the church leaders, or if he did, we don't have it in the Bible. He intends, and God intends, for all of us, not just elders and pastors, but everyone, to know what is said here. And I suppose the reason for that, or one reason at least, is that everyone might understand the true character of the elders and pastors and overseers in the church, what work they are to do, what kind of men they are to be. So, he says, so, in view of what I've just said, in view of the last part of chapter 4. And you remember, in the end of chapter 4, there seemed to be a shift. There seemed to be something of a change moving from chapter 4, verse 11 to chapter 4, verse 12. And up to chapter 4, verse 11, we lived in a world that we could recognize, a world with various pressures, everyday pressures, really, that we're used to as Christians. Pressures of being married to someone who's not a Christian. Uh, Pressures of living under government regulations, some of which might not be very wise or helpful, and so on and so on. But then things seemed to change, and he began to talk about a fiery trial, chapter 4, verse 12. And he seemed to be preparing his readers for a time of more intense opposition and hate and even official persecution, such as has come on the churches in different places from time to time. And that may be our future as well, even in our lifetime. So, with this in mind, let me remind you, he says, of what elders pastors and overseers are to be and what they're to do. Let me tell you what their very important work is because it will be very difficult work under persecution. It's the leaders who are picked off first, the pastors who are put in prison before anyone else. The head is cut off in the hope that the body will die. I think there's another connection here as well. And if you remember last time he talked about the judgment beginning at the household of God and the righteous being scarcely saved. Chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, he was encouraging us to take the long view and to consider eternity. And you can't really understand what elders should be doing unless you take that eternal perspective. And no elder will ever do his job properly unless he learns to look to the future reward, as we'll see. So Peter tells us these things, these six things in these verses. He tells us, first of all, that he was an elder. Peter was an elder, verse 1. Verse 2, he tells us that elders are shepherds, are overseers. Verse 3, he tells us that motive matters, verse 2 and 3. Verse 4, he tells us that the reward beggars belief. Reward if this work is done. Verse 5a, how to treat elders. And verse 5b, think low, clothe yourself with humility. Peter was an elder, elders are shepherds, are overseers, motive matters, the reward beggars belief, how to treat elders, and think low. I, Peter says, a fellow elder, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. I'm one of you, he says. I am on the same level as you. I understand your situation because I'm in the situation also. I'm an elder like you are. And I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now there's been this comparison of suffering and glory at a couple of points here. Suffering and glory to come. This was the point made in chapter 4 verse 13 for example. Rejoice as far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So now he says there is suffering in this world. He doesn't talk about his own sufferings. He says, I saw Christ suffer. So I know that faithful servants of God will suffer. I know that faithful elders will suffer. I know that anybody who wants to live a godly life will suffer in this world. I saw what happened to Christ. I saw how they treated him. And Peter's perhaps remembering the abuse they heaped on Christ at different points, the lies they told about him, the vicious criticisms and unfair attacks Many times they tried to get hold of him and uh, kill him, and he seemed to slip away out of their hands, as we saw this morning. And Peter was there when they arrested Jesus. 
You saw some of the sufferings of Christ on that night before he died. And although, as far as I can see in the Bible, he didn't actually stay and witness the crucifixion. He knew about it, I'm quite sure. He says, these sufferings then are the norm for servants of God and particularly for elders. But he says, I'm looking forward to the glory that is going to be revealed. I will have a share in it as well. I'm a fellow elder with you. I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. And I will share with you in the coming glory. More about that in a moment. The thing to notice here is how Peter puts himself on a level with all the other elders. He actually was slightly different from the ordinary church elder because he was an apostle. He was one of the people who'd seen Jesus during his ministry on earth. He'd seen Jesus risen from the dead, as we read in John 21. And more than that, he was told he was the chief apostle, the foundation stone of the church. Now, based on that kind of thinking, there developed in the centuries, as perhaps you know, a higher and higher respect for the Bishop of Rome. This developed quite early in the history of the church. The Bishop of Rome said, I'm taken over from Peter. Peter was the first Bishop of Rome. And so I am the chief among all the bishops and leaders of the churches all around the world. And they began more and more to say, look, you should, you should listen to me and you should let me have the last word on all the disputes and quarrels. And at certain points they persuaded the Roman emperor or other government figures to exile other bishops who disagreed with them and send them off into far-off countries and so on. So this became grander and grander and more and more important and developed into what we call today the papacy. And this was the justification for it, that... They were following in the succession of Peter. Well, you see nothing of that in the New Testament. All you see in the New Testament, as far as I can see, is congregations and elders. That's it. Yes, the generation of apostles, a unique generation, 12 of them and no more. But apart from that, apart from men such as Peter and Paul, that first generation, you have a church and you have the elders and that's it. And over here you have another church and another lot of elders. You have a church there with their elders. And occasionally the elders might get together and meet. The elders from different churches might come together. But they are independent churches. That's the New Testament pattern. Very, very different from this hierarchical structure that developed in the Church of Rome. But it's not only the structure that's different. It's the whole atmosphere of the thing. For one man to say, I'm the head over the other, the other leaders. I'm the chief one. I'm the final authority. I'm the vicar of Christ. Peter isn't saying anything like that, is he? Peter is humble enough and honest enough to say, I'm one elder among many. I'm the same as you. I'm a church leader just like you are. I am among you. And I exhort you as one of your fellow elders and servants of Christ. Furthermore, as we've already mentioned, and we'll look at it in more detail in a moment, The whole attitude of one person being a head and a leader over everyone else in the church of Christ seems to tell against this whole picture that the true glory is the glory to come, not the glory of this world. So Peter was an elder. In verse 2, then elders are shepherds, are overseers. The word shepherd there in verse 2 relates to our word pastor. It also is uh, literally the Greek word presbyter. And you sometimes see that word presbyter in different discussions of church leaders and so on. Likewise, the overseer, exercising oversight in verse 2, that relates to the word bishop. It's good to get behind that terminology that built up over the centuries and see the originals of these words. Elder, shepherd, overseer. And the elder and the overseer and the shepherd a one and the same person. The elders shepherd the flock of God, verse 2. The elders shepherd the group of people who belong to God. What a precious group of people then that local church must be. How precious if they are God's own people. How dear to him. Read this morning that this is the church that he obtained with his own blood. So this is the flock of God. The elders are not the owners. They're just the managers, the stewards. They're just serving under the chief shepherd. They're working for him. It's not their own flock. 
must be a very different mentality if you own a business than if you manage someone else's business. If you own your own shop, say, you own the building, you don't have to pay any money on it, it's your own, you can do what you like with it. If you want to leave it in a, a big mess with piles of stuff everywhere, open at odd hours and so on, it's up to you, it's your shop, you can do what you like. But if you're managing someone else's premises, then you're responsible, you're answerable. You've got to give an account. What did you do on Monday? How many customers came in? How much money did you take? Well, just so, this is the flock of God. And elders are called upon to shepherd the flock of God. Care, and specifically, to protect and to provide. To protect. We're told, not particularly here in 1 Peter, but elsewhere in the Bible, that there are fierce wolves who would come in among the people of God, distorting the truth, to draw followers after them, to make a name for themselves. Elders should be aware of this kind of thing. Not every Christian can be discriminating and discerning to say, hang on, that doesn't sound quite right. The sheep need shepherds at this point. I remember showing the youth group at church once a YouTube of wild sheep in the back of Turkey somewhere, this flock of wild sheep. And YouTube showed a wolf appearing and coming after them. And the wolf was running these sheep and they were running for their lives. And I said to these young people, what do those sheep need? And after a bit of thinking, they got it. They need a shepherd to protect them. They need a shepherd to drive the wolf away. Just so among the sheep of God. There must be elders who are ready to protect his flock, to shepherd the flock of God and to provide Well, sheep need food, and God's sheep need spiritual food. Jesus said to Peter three times, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, provide what they need, teach them, make sure they get the truth that they need. And we see Peter in the book of Acts doing exactly that, preaching sermons. We've got his letter here, feeding the sheep. We see the second letter that he wrote, he wrote at the end of his life almost, and he's still feeding the sheep. This is the job not just of Peter and the other great ones, but of every elder to shepherd the flock, providing spiritual food. Now, different elders work differently in this. You can imagine a church with a large number of elders. There might be some who particularly preach and others not so much. But they all have the role of seeing that the thing is done, done properly, that the sheep are fed. And it isn't just about ministry from the front either. If an elder visits you and you're in hospital, should you expect perhaps that he'll have just something, just a word or two perhaps from the scriptures to encourage you and pray with you? Elders feed the sheep, both individually and corporately. Elders shepherd the flock of God. And notice again that not only does Peter put himself among the elders, but he puts the elders among the flock. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Even here, there isn't a hierarchy. There isn't a distinction. You're not above them, he says to these elders. You're not different from them. You're part of the flock yourself. You're part of the same group. You're a shepherd, yes, but you're also a sheep. Shepherd the flock of God that's among you. There's nothing hierarchical here. Nothing that allows elders to lord it over other people. On the other hand, the elders are to exercise oversight. Still in verse 2. Elders are shepherds, are overseers. So elders oversee the life of the church. It's a kind of a a management role. But I don't think it means so much managing, say, the church picnic or the Sunday school outing. These things are important. (coughs) I think the kind of oversight that God has in mind here is an oversight of people's Christian lives. How are people doing? People flourishing, people thriving in the Lord. People reading the word at home, are people turning up regularly on a Sunday? How are people getting on with each other? Is there some quarrel underneath the surface? Elders have an oversight and should exercise that oversight of the life of the church, the spiritual life of the flock of God. Yes, I guess we shouldn't be too shocked or upset if 
one of our elders asked us a question then. Are you, how are you getting on with reading the Bible? What opportunities have you had to share your faith recently? So on. Quite a challenging picture, isn't it? Oversight. Well, so much depends on the attitude with which it's done, of course. And this is our third point as we move through verse 2 and on into verse 3. Elders are shepherds are overseers, yes, but motive matters. Motive matters, thirdly. I want you to imagine that a young person is thinking about his working life. What job is he going to have? What career would he like to follow? He might think to himself, you know what, I quite like the idea of having quite a bit of free time. I like travelling. I like going to see my friends. I don't want the kind of job that ties you down day after day, week after week. I want to be able to come and go a bit. I want to be flexible. Or he might think, I want the kind of job that allows me to make a lot of money. Be rich. He might think, I like a job with a a career progression. I like something where you can advance and and become somebody important, like maybe a a medical consultant or a head teacher in a school. I I want to rise up and have a, a, a position not to start with, perhaps, but certainly after a few years. I, I want to be taking the big decisions. Free time, a lot of money, status, or he could decide to be an elder, a pastor. Because as Peter teaches the attitude that pastors and elders need to have, all these three things are ruled out. They are not allowed, they are invalid in a church leader. A church leader must not be under compulsion. He must be willing. He mustn't be reluctant. He mustn't be lazy. He mustn't have to have his arm twisted and cajoled to do anything. He's got to be energetic, vigorous in serving. Not for shameful gain. Well, dishonest gain, yes, it's legitimate for people to be paid for their work. We understand that from the Bible elsewhere. But the opportunities for dishonest gain in church life, the trust that people have in their elders and pastors and the opportunity to exploit that, take advantage of willing, naive people, to take advantage of the sheep of God to, to line your own pocket. What a horrible thing to do, but it can be done. It's been done. Peter says, no, you, you must not be in it for the money. You must not be looking to make money out of people. Go and work somewhere else, but don't be an elder in God's church. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. And then verse 3, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Not lording it over people. Well, as I said, this is a major part, isn't it, of why people do the jobs they do and follow the careers that they do. People love that importance to to be in charge of, of of an outfit, to have people answering to you, to be able to tell people what to do, to have that leading role, to be able to set out the plan and say, right, you do this and you do this and you do this. Peter says that kind of domineering attitude has no place in church leadership. It's wrong. It shouldn't be the motive. To make yourself somebody important, somebody great, that's not the elder's place. That's not the pastor's job. Again, there are opportunities for self-promotion in Christian service. They abound. Strong-minded, domineering personalities can get results and build congregation numbers and budgets. But instead of telling everybody else what to do in that domineering way, the elder is to be an example to the flock. And that is a major part of the job that an elder, a pastor, should be a role model Christian. People can learn, not just from the teaching, but from looking at the man and saying, that's how he handles himself. That's how he deals with this situation. That's how he copes with this problem. And what a powerful thing this example can be. It's unlike any other job in that, isn't it? If you, if you had a career in finance or administration, it wouldn't matter what your personal life is. Do you hit the targets? Do you achieve the goals? Do you make the budget? It doesn't matter if your home life's falling apart or whatever. Well, church leadership is different. The elder, the pastor, the overseer must (coughs) not exercise oversight under compulsion, but willingly. 
Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering, but being an example to the flock. So what's the reward of this job then? What's, I mean, every job has to have a reward, right? If it's not making money, if it's not getting yourself a big name and reputation, if it's not the fact that you can slack off and take it easy, what, what is the reward? What the heck? It's a very difficult job then, it turns out. It's a kind of job where it's very unlikely that any one of us could ever say, I've done a good job. Who can say that they've done this well? As Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 2.16, who is sufficient for these things? So many have been discouraged and found that it's too hard and unrewarding. Wondered why they got into it. Whether they can keep going. Well, if people turn back and say, well, it's not rewarding to be in church leadership, they haven't appreciated what the reward is. Verse 4. I would suggest to you, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, I would suggest that the reward beggars belief. Church elders, not a chance to show off then. It's not a chance to get rich quick. It's not a chance to take your foot off the pedal and take it easy. But you're serving the chief shepherd and he knows. He knows what's done in his name. He knows what's done for his sake. He knows how his servants are working. And he knows how to reward them. I mean, can you imagine this? Verse 4. The chief shepherd appears and certain people receive from him an unfading crown of glory. Can you imagine that? Just imagine being there. Christ. Certain ones are handed this, this crown in his presence, from his hand. It's unfading. That's it. say it's eternal. It's forever. This morning we thought about a punishment in hell, which is eternal. There's no end to it. But these rewards are eternal as well. Those few years that a man served faithfully in his church, he is honored forever on that basis. For all eternity. The crown... In the ancient world, people were given crowns for various different things. You could get a crown if you won an athletics contest, but it would be made of leaves, so it would only last for one year, if that. Or you could get a crown from the general if you fought with exceptional bravery in battle. A crown would set you apart from other people and say, this is a person of special distinction. Imagine an eternal, unfading crown. And this crown, we're told then, is an unfading crown of glory. So there's something about this of of the glory of God himself. These men then are marked with something of God for all eternity. Well, uh, I don't know whether this is normal among elders and pastors. I find it very, very easy to think of my own shortcomings as a pastor and the ways in which I haven't come up to scratch. I don't know whether that's the usual attitude or not. I would be happy to be in glory, uh, such things as an unfading crown and so on, I would think are rather beyond me. But I am pleased about this. And it does seem right to me when I think of other people. And perhaps you can think of different elders that you've known and people that you've admired and be pleased that the Lord rewards them in this way. Years ago, there was a man I knew in the Anglican Church in Cheadle. He had a, a background in the Brethren Church, and uh, he told me that as a young man, he'd had a rather nasty accident. He'd been involved in a youth event. He set up the sound system, and there was some problem with the wiring. It had given him a massive electric shock. He'd, uh, still, when I knew him, he had a damaged hand and damaged eyesight as a result of this accident. And he'd had to spend time in hospital. And the problem he had with this was this had been a Christian event. He'd been serving the Lord. And this terrible thing had happened to him. So this made him very bitter and resentful towards God. And he wouldn't let anyone from the church in to see him. He sent them all away. He didn't want anything to do with them or God. Then the elder came. 
And he said to me, Tom, I couldn't turn him away. This man had been so much a part of his life since he was a boy, so gracious, so kind to him, so godly. He had to see him. He couldn't send him away. And that elder then was able to sit on the bed with him and uh, hear all his problems and his complaints and talk gently with him and read the scripture with him and pray with him. And it's because of that man that Paul, when I knew him, was walking with the Lord. It's under God, that elder who restored him. And uh, men like that, I'm thrilled to think that we might see them in glory with crowns on their heads. I am thrilled that the Lord rewards him in that way. I don't suppose that man ever wrote a book that anyone might have read. I dare say he didn't preach from a platform at a big convention. Maybe he wasn't much of a preacher at all. But he did the work of the shepherd. He shepherded the flock of God. He exercised oversight. And he will have his reward when the chief shepherd appears. So it is a rewarding job then. It is a rewarding job when done in the way that the Lord asked for it to be done. How do you treat elders then? Verse 5, fifth point. How do you treat them? It seems a bit strange, doesn't it, suddenly to read about younger people, as if to say they're the elders and there are the young people and nobody else. And you say, well, there are other people. There are older people and sometimes younger people are elders and so on. It, seems, it doesn't seem to quite square off. There are various suggestions about that. One suggestion is that Paul, uh, Peter rather, is writing because it's particularly the younger people who are generally most awkward in church life. <laughs> I don't know whether that's true, actually, in my experience. I have to say my experience has been that old people can also be quite awkward when they have a mind to be. So I'm not sure that's the right way of looking at it. I think it's probably better, the suggestion that I've read, to think of the challenge being for everybody to regard the elders as you would regard an older man. You know that in the Bible, at least, we look up to those who are older than us. We respect them. We treat them differently from the way we treat people who are younger than us. In the Bible, Paul says, treat younger men as brothers, but older men as fathers. And so I think here the equation is that you have the elders and you have everybody else treating them with the respect of older men, even though they might not be older men. Does that make sense? Elders, elders and younger people who are not elders, who look up to them in this way. And in fact, the word here is very strong, isn't it, in verse 5? Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Very strong word. There's been a bit of a theme in 1 Peter of, of submitting. If you remember, just turn back, actually, and remind yourself of uh, chapter 2, verse 13, for example. Chapter 2, verse 13, do you remember all the way back there, Peter told us to be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And a bit later on in the same chapter, verse 18, servants be subject to your masters. And chapter 3, verse 1, wives be subject to your husbands. But here, the same basic idea, but a different, stronger word, more direct, blunter, less room to say, well, I'm not sure about that and I disagree with this and so on. Submit. Now again, I hesitate really to apply this strongly and in detail. I feel in doing so I'd be a little bit like the, the husband who makes a great deal of all the Bible verses to do with his wife and everything she should be doing. That's not really a good way to uh, conduct your marriage as a Christian husband. You need to look very carefully at the verses that apply to you as a husband, as I'm sure you all know, those of you who are married. And uh, so I feel the same way here, that it's not really my place to say, well, you'd be subject in this way and this way and this way and do this and you're not doing that and so on. I think rather I need to leave you to think about this and to work your response to it and to consider it. And I do know as I read this verse that it has been abused this and the one or two other similar verses in the New Testament have been misused. Church leaders have quoted these words and applied them very strongly to their congregation as a way of domineering over them, as we are told not to do back in verse four, or verse 3. 
church leaders have exercised too much influence over their congregations by telling them, you should be subject to us. We are the elders. It has been unhealthy. It has amounted in some cases to spiritual bullying. It has left some people scarred and spiritually disappointed and disillusioned with the entire Christian faith. I have to say that there's a danger the other way, and perhaps this is more the danger for our kinds of churches. There's a danger also, isn't there, of a, of a kind of rugged isolation in the Christian life. I've got my Christian life, and my Christian life is fine. Thank you very much. I don't need anyone overseeing me. I don't need anyone shepherding me. I certainly don't intend to be subject to anyone. In fact, I think that I can see some ways in which you elders could be doing a much better job. I'm sure I tended to think that way as a younger man in the church I was in, and uh, perhaps others have as well. And uh, that also is a danger. We keep the elders at safe distance, some people might say. We don't want them interfering too closely in our lives. Well, that may be understandable in some cases, but there should be. There should be a blessing here in what the Lord says that we should be doing. There should be a means of blessing and encouragement for those who are able to be subject to their elders in whatever kind of church. I must leave that for you to to think through and move on to the last point, verse 5 again. Think low, think low. Humble yourself. Clothe yourself with humility. All of you, all of us, clothe ourselves with humility towards one another. Humility is the attitude which says to somebody else, you are important. Your desires are important to me. Your needs are important to me. Your ideas are important to me. What you need is more important than what I need. That's humility. A yielding spirit. You are worthy of my attention. You are worthy of my my energy and efforts. Now, it doesn't come naturally to us. One writer has said, every one of us has the soul of a king. That's the fallen human nature speaking there. Every one of us has the soul of a king. So Peter says, clothe yourself. Put this stuff on. Make a choice that you're going to exercise humility and take that choice around with you like the suit of clothes that you wear. Every morning you get up and you think, well, is it a hot day today? Is it cold? Do I need a jacket? Do I need a jumper? What kind of shirt or blouse should I wear? How do I want to present myself to the world? How am I going to appear to the people who see me? Peter says, as well as your morning clothes, put on humility, tie it on to you. And especially in your dealings with other Christians. Clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Church life. The elders, the younger ones, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility. Deal humbly with each other. This should be the uniform of the people of God. Pride, the uniform of those who don't know God. Get rid of all self-promoting at the expense of those around you, especially your fellow Christians, because God is the enemy of the proud. God opposes the proud. If I'm proud in my dealings with you and offhand and a bit dismissive and contemptuous, then God will oppose me. I don't want that. Yes, I may be his child, but he'll still oppose me if I behave in a proud and arrogant way, especially to my brother, sister Christian. I know, and you know, I'm sure, that we need grace from God. We need grace. We need help that comes from above. We need loving kindness that he supplies. But he gives that grace to the humble. So that's why I must clothe myself with humility towards you and you must do the same towards me. What grace there is. What kindness for those who are low and self-effacing. Whatever you need, whether it's more wisdom or faith, more understanding, more holiness, more love. God has it. God supplies it. But only humble people receive these things. 
Clothe yourself with humility towards one another, Peter says. You want grace from God? Learn humility towards others. Learn to think low. So that's a job description for elders and pastors then, as Peter gives it to us. Peter was an elder himself. He says, I'm one among you, I'm like you, I'm the same as you. So there's no hierarchy then in the church. There's no different degrees of church leadership as developed in the history after Peter's day. Elders are shepherds, are overseers, verse 2. So there's a great responsibility then on elders and pastors to shepherd the sheep, to oversee the people of God, to care, to provide, to protect spiritual food for the people whom God has entrusted to us, providing what's needed so that the sheep can thrive. Motive matters, unlike most other jobs that you could do, verses 2 and 3. Motive is essential. All the advantages that different people might get from their secular jobs, none of them apply here. They're all ruled out. An elder's not to uh, wag off uh, and cultivate a lot of free time, nor to try to enrich himself and get rich quick at the church's expense, and nor to lord it over people and domineer, but rather to serve as an example, willingly, eagerly. And the reward, verse 4, I think beggars belief. I think this is extraordinary that uh, men such as us might receive a crown from the hand of Christ. Well, I can think of people who merit that and it's an honour to know them and it will be great to see them honoured in glory with this unfading crown. What a great reward for those who serve the chief shepherd faithfully. But how do you treat elders, verse 5? It's very simple. Submit to them. And all of us are called on in verse 5 to think low. All of us are called on to humble ourselves in our dealings with each other. Let's pray together.